So my name is David Harris. Uh, I'm with the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Racial Justice here at the law school. On behalf of Professor Brian Nagan and Dean Manning, I want to welcome you to the law school. We're really pleased to have you with us for a very special event today. We have with us one of, uh, uh, one of our, our, our great historians and uh, a, a real treasure who's going to share with us uh, uh, her new book, uh, The Coming of the KKK, The Second Coming of the KKK. I'm going to leave it to my colleague, uh, Donald Yakovum, to make a more formal introduction. But before I do that, I wanted to go over a few upcoming events to let you know that uh, we're not done yet uh, this semester. So next uh, Tuesday, we will have a, a gentleman named Travis Bristol, uh, who is a, a professor of education at BU, who will be giving a talk uh, entitled, Policing and Teaching, the Positioning of Black Male Teachers as agents in the universal carceral apparatus. He's going to talk about the fact that uh, black male teachers are, are considered and used as police in the classroom. That's at noon next, uh, next uh, Tuesday. The following day, we're really pleased to have with us uh, Jean uh, Thea Harris, uh, who will discuss her new book, A More Beautiful and Terrible History, The Uses and Misuses of Civil Rights History. A look at what she calls uh, the, the uses and abuses of uh, civil rights history. We, he, she will be joined by Professor Khalil Muhammad as a discussant. And uh, we're actually hopeful to have one more event later in the month. We'll have the second installment of our uh, dispatches from the front lines of community justice, uh, which will focus on some things that have been happening in Minneapolis. I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter, go to our website to keep track of these events, and you will be duly notified. Uh, finally, I have to thank the Hutchins Center for African and American Research, uh, which is co-sponsoring today's event, and this always is a, is a, is a wonderful co-sponsor. I suspect some of you heard about it through them. Uh, and then, finally, I have to give thanks and praise to my colleague, Kelly Arvin, who actually showed up today uh, so to accept our applause for all the work she's done to make this happen. So, Kelly Garvin. Uh, as a final preliminary detail, uh, copies of the book are available outside, uh, uh, made available by the Harvard Coop for the Coop member price of $25. So I encourage you uh, to purchase the book, and uh, Professor Gordon will be available to sign uh, copies after the reading. So, so now it's my real pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Donald Yakovone, who will sit there and try to be as, as calm and modest as he can, and I won't embarrass him terribly. For those of you who know me, I'm not a big CV reading kind of intro guy, so I'm not going to uh, detail a lot about Donald except to say that over the years we've worked with him on several projects, and it's been unbelievably enlightening and enjoyable to do so. Uh, the one thing I will say, uh, kind of in terms of his accomplishments, uh, he has received the prestigious W.E.B. Du Bois Medal, the highest honor awarded by Harvard <clears throat> in the field of African and African American studies. Uh, he has produced numerous volumes on his own and in collaboration with others, including uh, many, the African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross, with Professor Skip Gates, most recently. A scholar of the Civil War and abolitionism, Donald's current work is a testament to both his scholarship and his insight. Uh, we have recently published a piece on our Medium page featuring his current research on te called Teaching White Supremacy, U.S. History Textbooks and the Influence of Historians. Uh, this work and another soon to come, which I just read over the weekend, uh, is, uh, are marvelous pieces of work and examples of how a true scholar finds a, a, a small uh, kernel uh, of evidence and follows it through uh, to uh, really remarkable uh, insight. So with no further ado, I ask that you join me in welcoming Donald Yakovone. Thank, thank you all for coming. The movement's advocates claimed to be restoring 100% Americanism. They opposed immigrants, especially from Catholic Mexico, claimed the alien illegal immigrants took away American jobs, attacked fake news, blamed Jews and people of color for, the many, for many of the country's worst ills, saw a conspiracy of the worst kind deep in American government, a government within a government denounced political corruption, and claimed that they would rescue the country from enemies within. It found enormous support among evangelical Protestants and the middle and working classes, captured legislatures around the country, 
but especially in the Midwest. It proclaimed to be the largest movement in the United States history ever. It chronicled exagger it chronically, excuse me, exaggerated the size of its crowds and membership, captured the support of thousands of women while its leaders engaged in sexual assault, refused to pay its debts, spewed the worst kind of demagoguery, exemplified greed, crime, hypocrisy, and liter literally got caught with its pants down. I would understand if you thought I'd been describing the current grand cyclops in the White House and the movement he leads, but you would be wrong. This and the whole lot more was the United States of the 1920s, and specifically the reborn Ku Klux Klan, described so persuasively in the second coming of the coming, <clears throat> excuse me, of the KKK. Linda Gordon is university professor of the humanities and the Florence Kelly Professor of History at New York University. She established her expertise in gender, family history, and the birth control debate, <clears throat> especially with women's body women's right, a social history of birth control in America, which came out originally in 1976 and was uh, in its second edition in 1990. Among her many books are Pitied but Not Entitled, Single Mothers and the Origins of Welfare, which was in 1994. Her 1999 study, The Great Arizona Orphan Abduction, won the P Bancroft Prize for the best book in United States history the AHA's Beverage Prize, that's the Association uh, <coughs> of uh, boy, sorry, I'll just skip it. <laughs> Beverage Prize for the best book on the history of the Americas and the Willer Cather Nonfiction Prize for writing uh, the West and her 2009 biography of Dorothea Lange, A Life Beyond Limits, also won the Bancroft Prize. I think it's fair to say that the second coming of the KKK upsets just about everything you may have thought about the most venomous but most American of organizations. Immensely popular, largely open, and painfully public, its popularity is hard to fathom at first. For about 10 years, it may have been one of the most influential and powerful organizations in the United States. Equal parts social club, political party, religious denomination, Freemason society, Rotary, and even Fuller Brush Company. It became an avenue of social advancement for groups consciously or unconsciously suffering status anxiety. It became a path into the middle class. More northern and western than southern, it found proud supporters throughout the United States, especially sheriffs and police officers that is, police officers outside of New York City and Boston. For a time, it published 150 newspapers and magazines, established two colleges, and even founded a motion picture company. It presented itself as an anti-elitist and anti-corruptionist, battled the liquor interests while privately drinking their fill, of course, won the support of 40,000 Protestant ministers, and may have elected 75 congressmen. And it certainly did elect 11 governors, 16 U.S. senators, and countless state and local officials. Its reach proved nearly unprecedented and its influence terrible. For example, the head of the U.S. House Ju Judiciary Committee was Hatton Summers, a Klan member who quashed efforts to pass anti-lynching legislation. Indiana proved to be an epicenter of the new Klan, and the organization elected 11 of its 13 congressmen. A good son, Borglum, sculptor of Mount Rushmore, was a member, and at least two U.S. Supreme Court justices belonged, Hugo Black and, I'm not making this up, Edward Douglas White. Its power saturated, saturated the Democratic Party to the point that its 1924 convention became known as the Klan Bake. And at one point, even Harry Truman was a member. Perhaps, most astonishingly, the Klan produced its own version of feminism, drawing into its fold Quaker feminist, something that sent my head spinning. In its origins, development, and operation, and especially in its greed, hate, and self-destructive qualities, it is a decidedly American institution. Indeed, W.E.B. Du Bois' biographer, David Levering Lewis, wrote on the book's back cover that the story of the Klan during the 1920s is disturbingly typical as American 
as apple pie. Well, let's have a slice. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Gordon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a most unspring-like day. Thank you for a very kind introduction, although it sounds to me like you could give this talk as well as I could, since you obviously knew this stuff. On July 4th, 1923, a mass Independence Day celebration attracted 50,000 people to Kokomo, Indiana. Reserve train cars brought in people from uh, throughout Indiana and nearby state. The food was so plentiful that it required several rows of tables, each extending the distance of a block. In addition to the heaps of casseroles and desserts, the organizers provided 5,000 cases of near beer. Remember, this is prohibition, near beer. Uh, 55,000 buns and six tons of beef, 250 pounds of coffee, 2,500 pies, a children's area with games and sports, et cetera, et cetera. This is a picture of not that one, but a similar, uh, similar event. And I start with this because I think one of the main things I need to underline here is how completely commonplace and, for most people, respectable, this Ku Klux Klan was. Um, I have to start by, uh, I suspect most of you, when you think of Ku Klux Klan, you associate it with the Southern terrorist organization whose primary method was violence. I call it terrorist because it is terrorist in the literal sense of that term, meaning that when it is lynching people, it is not just because they don't like that person, but because they are sending a message designed to intimidate an entire African-American population. This clan, which was born in 1920, actually continued. It did not consider itself separate, but it was so different that historians began to call it the second clan. Uh, you've already heard some of the ways in which it was different. Um, but just to underscore the most important ones, it was, strength was in the North. We're talking about an organization with somewhere between three and six million members. We don't know exactly. The Klan loved to exaggerate its numbers. It had one and a half million members of the women's Ku Klux Klan. And probably it's its most brilliant strategic move was to expand its bigotry beyond African Americans to take in Catholics and Jews. Um, many of the contemporary critics like to call the Klan's people a bunch of unsophisticated, uneducated, uh, uh, rural kind of hicks. Um, they were dead wrong. Uh, a couple of studies have shown, in fact, that the educational level of Klan's people was quite similar to those of the region at large. Furthermore, although there were some kinds of, uh, this is just a photograph of the invitation to one of these, uh, the recording company, um, although uh, there were some kinds of science it didn't like at all, notably evolution, but it loved uh, technology. Uh, at n several of these events, a, a small airplane, I just want to see if I have that photograph. No, I don't. A small airplane circled the fairgrounds and then made a very dramatic landing. In one of these cases, the, the airplane actually had on, the, on its fuselage um, lights uh, showing a, a cross. And um, for many people, it was the first time they had seen an airplane. Um, the 1920s Klan arose in part as a backlash against the very large scale immigration that was coming into the United States starting in the 1880s. And a crucial factor about this immigration was that most of these immigrants were not Protestant. 
they were Catholics from Southern Europe, uh, Jews and Greek and Russian Orthodox coming from, from Eastern Europe. Uh, there, there were all kinds of backlashes against this immigration, and the Klans was not entirely new. What Americans called a nativist movement had been very, very uh, vocal since long before this uh, wave of immigration. Uh, but what the Klan did was, in some ways, to build an alliance with white evangelicals. Uh, with a tremendous, uh, just repetitive, constant chorus of um, uh, tales about how awful the Catholics were and similarly about, about Jews. Um, this is just a, a photograph of, of something I wanted to show to indicate something about the uh, ordinariness of an accept, widespread acceptance of the Klan. Uh, they not only fielded bas baseball teams, but they actually competed in a semi-professional baseball league under the name uh, Ku Klux Klan. Um, this is typical, a typical cartoon about what's wrong with Catholics. Uh, I don't know if you can, how much of this you can read, but this is the papal octopus, uh, which they call Romanism. And you know, the standard, the most important criticism of the Catholics is that because they are subordinate to a pope, therefore they cannot be patriotic Americans. And I would want to point out to you that that accusation uh, appeared uh, as recently, at least in my lifetime, as 1960 when John Kennedy was running for president. Um, the um, Catholics, the Catholic uh, allegations and the proof, so to speak, that these people were uh, obedient only to the Pope came through another uh, thing that is quite typical of this kind of organization, and that is conspiracy theory. These were masters of conspiracy theory. Uh, some of the conspiracies that it alleged were worldwide. For example, uh, these immigrants, these Catholic immigrants, were not coming to the United States because they were poor and looking for a better life. They were coming because the Pope ordered them to come. And upon arrival, they went underground and uh, operated, I think the best analogy I know is like moles in an espionage plot. They were going to remain underground until such time as the Pope gave the signal for the coup that was going to seize America uh, for Catholic power. Um, they were um, quick to claim also that in their evangelical Protestantism, they were actually serving, uh, serving Jesus, serving uh, the, the religion. Uh, they repeated uh, what describes this, um, this cartoon. If Jesus were alive today, he would be a Klansman. The... Um, the tremendous hostility also to this notion that there was a melting pot was based on another kind of idea, which is that these people could not melt. They would never, um, never be acceptable. Um, another aspect of this was ultra, ultra uh, patriotism and seizing upon Uncle Sam as their symbol along with Jesus. Another problem with the Pope was what, how he was brainwashing America's children. And the argument here was that not only that he was using the schools, but that, that his, uh, his servants were insinuating subliminal messages into the curriculum of the public schools that was uh, preparing uh, students to be able to convert to Catholicism. Everywhere, in every state, the Klan uh, tried to, to uh, get legislation passed that banned parochial schools. 
Uh, this legislation only passed in one state. It happens to be my home state, Oregon. Uh, it didn't come into effect because the Supreme Court overturned it. But um, of interest to me, probably the lawyers among you may not be that as surprised as I was, the Supreme Court overturned it not on the grounds that it was discriminatory, but on the grounds that it was a taking because it amounted to seizing property that belonged to the Catholic hierarchy. Um, now, the, this one is hard to read. I'll, I'll say a little bit about it. But the, the anti-Semitism was um, escalated, particularly by Henry Ford. Uh, some of you uh, know that Henry Ford was an arch anti-Semite. He seized upon a very famous forgery known as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This was a Russian forgery that uh, claimed to be the text of a plan by a kind of international cabal of Jewish financiers as their method of taking over the world. Henry Ford, um, let me see if I have, I don't have that. Henry Ford uh, published 500,000 copies of this as well as serializing it in the newspaper that he ran called the Dearborn Independent. Um, Again, I don't want to imply that Henry Ford invented anti-Semitism. And I also think it's important to understand that anti-Semitism was by no means uh, the exclusive property of the far right. Well, the uh, most respected academics, professionals, corporate leaders were pretty open about their anti-Semitism. This is the period where most universities, including this one, had a Jewish quota uh, to prevent too many Jews from getting in. There was even a Jewish quota in the school I went to. And if you want, later I can tell you how I slipped in. Um, but the, um, the case against the Jews was a little bit different. If you were a Catholic, you could convert to Protestantism and then you were be, would be fine, provided, of course, that you were white because you could not uh, be a person of color and be in the Klan. Jews could never be okay. They could never uh, be American. The, in this sense, and this is an important distinction that I only really understood through this research, the anti-Semitism is actually closer to the anti-black racism than it is to religious prejudice because it is, it's in the body uh, that these people, now they're different from blacks, they have different problems in their bodies, but it is um, uh, unchangeable. Uh, my favorite story about this is that um, you all know the story of Jonah and the whale, right? The whale swallowed Jonah and he came out whole. Well, in one of the clans renditions of this story, he came out whole because Jews are indigestible. <laughs> Which perhaps they meant literally, but obviously it's a metaphor for what, uh, what they have against the Jews. Um, they also accused the Jews of being in cahoots with African Americans. I, I hesitate to show this, and there are many like it, just because it is so ugly. Uh, but let me point out that, in a way, they were prescient, because although it was not particularly true at this time that Jews were in alliance with African Americans, it did become true in the period of the Civil Rights Movement when a very disproportionate number of Jews were uh, supporting the, the Civil Rights Movement. Um, the Klan wore these robes that included masks. But you should not think that that was because they wanted to disguise their uh, membership in the Klan. Uh, in, in struggling against the Klan, several states actually passed regulations prohibiting marching or marches with masked people. The Klan happily obliged, took off their masks. It didn't uh, bother, it didn't disturb their popularity at all. Uh, the robes had to do with a very, very arcane 
set of rituals that the clan engaged in, and some of you may have read about or seen some of these. They, they renamed everything words that begin with KL, the Klegel, the Clocan, the Clonvocation, et cetera. They had a, a code for the days of the week, a separate code for the months of the year, and so on. Um, but what's important here is this was not hugely different from what was going on in a lot of fraternal and some sororal organizations of the time. Uh, in the late 19th century, a huge proportions of Americans belonged to these fraternal groups. And furthermore, these fraternal groups were also ethnically and religiously exclusive, right? There were Irish groups, there were German groups, there were groups of particular Protestant sects, there were African American groups, there were Jewish groups. And in their defense, the Klan liked to claim, well, we're not doing anything very different from what these other fraternal organizations were doing. Furthermore, these, these uh, costumes uh, had both symbolic value, but it also signaled a kind of unanimity. And if you look at scenes like this, you can see the sort of visceral, visual impression that uh, a, a gathering like this could be. Uh, this is a relatively small one, but also when you have groups like this in which you have literally thousands of people uh, marching down the streets. Now, the whiteness was a, uh, the whiteness of the, uh, of the robes, although you see that the leaders were allowed to wear bright colors. But the whiteness of the robes had a lot of symbolic meanings that are, I think, pretty important to understanding uh, what, what attracted people to the Klan and what they believed. The white stood, of course, for purity and, of course, for the white race. Uh, but it also meant rejection of sin and particularly rejection of drinking, although, as you heard, there was a lot of hypocrisy about the drinking. It represented female chastity, but again, it's not clear that the Klan's gender ideology was that different from that of that was the dominant ideology in the U.S. at the time. What I think people here might find most uh, most strange is that purity also meant homogeneity. And one of the characteristics of these clans people is a tremendous anxiety about what we would call diversity. Their idea was that diversity always creates disorder. And the only way to have law and order is when people are all uh, marching uh, to the same uh, notion. D diversity was to the Klan a form of pollution, uh, of uncleanliness. Uh, the, uh, the, um, you, you see this over and over again in the literature in which they use constantly the notion of the biblical Babel. Now it is true that the word Babel has come to mean a uh, polyglot number of languages, but in fact, you know, if you look at the Old Testament, the battle was not a pejorative at all. It was not a bad place. And I think it may have been that the Klan actually uh, was an influence in introducing this usage of the concept of Babel. Now, like all fraternal orders, the Klan offered the pleasures of male bonding. Its rhetoric was repetitively masculinist. The members were real men, non-members, especially Jews, were effeminized. At the University of Wisconsin, where the Ku Klux Klan was a, frater a registered fraternity under that name, as it was in several universities, at the University of Wisconsin, the hazing of new pledges to the fraternity uh, required them to parade around the Capitol pushing baby carriages. Um, the minutes of one clavern, which was a Klan chapter, read, remember, this is not an old maids convention. One Klan political candidate called an anti-Klan newspaper a poor old female busy feathering its nest. Now, the rituals, these arcane uh, secret rituals, 
really were important in developing this male bonding. In fact, what's significant about the Klan is that they were able to benefit both from secrecy but also from lack of secrecy. They were open. Uh, their membership was not secret. They had public lectures uh, that people paid to attend. They had uh, thousands of lecturers traveling the country uh, introducing the Klan to people. But on the other hand, the r rituals that went on just among Klan's people were supposed to be extremely perfectly secret. And every new pledge was made to swear a really fearsome oath about the terrible things that would happen to you if you let any information about this ritual out into the public. Um, when I first came across this, I, I tended to think of this ritual as like, oh, uh, I don't know, Dungeons and Dragons or 10-year-old boys games, but I came to see it as something different, which is, I think it was really, um, this is just another image of this, of these patterns, I think it was a form of theater of participatory theater. And it was actually fairly medievalist in what it was about. And I think that the Klan discovered that this was actually an attraction because it was a form of entertainment. And we have to remember this is a time when uh, movies and radio were still relatively new. Most Americans did not at this time own radios yet. Uh, so it was, uh, it was fun. However, it lost, its, it lost its charm. And that was one of the weaknesses of the Klan that I'll talk about later, which is that I think people got bored with it. Uh, because, and as one Klan's person uh, mentioned, uh, he said, the problem with this Klan is it seems like the only thing they do is recruit more people to the Klan. In other words, he didn't feel that he was part of something that was furthering his goals. However, the the most important attraction of the Klan to a lot of men was vigilantism. Now, I have said, uh, I want to emphasize, this Klan was mainly nonviolent, overwhelmingly nonviolent. In fact, in some of the moments where there was actually uh, f uh, physical fights, it was the anti-Klan people who started it, because when the Klan had the temerity to try to invade particularly uh, places that were uh, centers of industrial labor, particularly mining towns or a town like Carnegie, Pennsylvania, uh, they were driven out uh, by uh, union people and workers who threw things at them and so on. And in fact, in some cases, actually shot and killed Klan's people. But uh, the Klan's leaders also understood something really important. And that is that on the one hand, they had everything to gain from emphasizing their nonviolence, their law-abidingness, their complete respectability. But they also knew that certain categories of men, particularly young men, were really attracted by the promise of being able to participate in vigilantism. Sorry, I, I get these out of order, but this is one of the scenes where the Klansmen are, are landing by by airplane. Um, uh, I'll go into this when I talk about money. The, the main vigilantist uh, activity was directed against violators of prohibition. However, in their defense of prohibition, the Klan uh, racialized or bigotized it because in their propaganda, it was only Catholics who drank and only Jews who were the bootleggers. So they took this and uh, assimilated it uh, to their point of view. Um, the, there was another aspect of the Klan's vigilantism that is hugely important. As, as you heard, the single largest occupational group in the Klan were uh, law and order officers, police, sheriffs, deputies, and so on. Uh, you have uh, on record the comments of many police chiefs that their, um, their police force was entirely clanized. Um, the Portland, Oregon clan announced that 150 members of the police department had become, quote, citizens of the clan. The mayor of Portland formed a 100-man vigilante force 
and asked the Klan to advise him in selecting the members of this force. And the Anaheim, California city government allowed on-duty police officers to patrol in Klan robes. Um, the, uh, this vigilantism did not seem to alienate women at all. Uh, they did not participate, but there is absolutely no sign of any disapproval in the documents coming from the women's Ku Klux Klan. And in fact, these women did not wait to be invited to form an auxiliary, but rushed into the chance to start their own women's clan. And by 1923, they claimed to have chapters in all 48 states. In Indiana, the women's KKK boasted a membership of 250,000. And I don't really believe that they exaggerated all the time, but just as an example of what we're talking about, if that were true, it would have meant that one third of all the white Protestant women were members of the Klan. Um, in fact, the women were so eager in their participation in the Klan that there were reports of conflicts with their husbands who did not want them to be so busy out of the home in this kind of activity. Here you meet a contradiction that I think you see in just about all conservative politics. And that is you have women who, whose rhetoric, if you ask them what they believed about the place of women, they would say women belong in the home, women's destiny is to be mothers, etc. But once they have an opportunity to become active out of the home, in the public sphere, in political activism, they actually find that they really love it. It's a lot of fun. This led directly to conflict within the Klan. Um, several women's clans uh, started refusing to ship their, the part of the dues upward to the main headquarters of the male clan, which they were supposed to do. Many male clans, uh, clansmen tried to uh, control and t control the women's chapters, and to appoint who would head of the who would head these chapters. Several guys wanted their wives to be the heads of a local women's chapter, and women resisted that. Um, there's a, an extraordinarily and somewhat funny story uh, f from Portland about uh, a time when um, a clan a clan leader actually marched into the meeting of the women's clavern and forcibly tried to depose the leader that they chose. He failed to do that. He failed to be able to do that. Uh, and it's interesting, this particular clan in, uh, in Oregon chose as their kind of heroine Joan of Arc. Now, I'm sure I don't need to point out to you that Joan of Arc was a Catholic. <laughs> um, and I, I remember wondering if they couldn't find a Protestant heroine who... <laughs> but, but clearly what you see here is they're wanting to identify not only with a woman of tremendous uh, strength and influence, but a woman who completely defied uh, the standard uh, gender roles. Um, but I need to talk a little bit about the Klan's financing. Uh, and I don't know if this is going to make you feel better or worse. The Klan was, first of all, a for-profit corporation, and it was a pyramid scheme. The Klan was literally incorporated in Atlanta, this uh, version of the Klan. And for example, when, when the second imperial wizard, Hiram Evans, succeeded from the first imperial wizard, woman Sim William Simmons, he had to buy the organization. Now, I don't know how much money actually changed hands, but this was part of a legal development. Then, the pyramid scheme. Um, if, if I recruit you to be a member of the Klan, you have to pay $10. That's the initiation fee, and that is worth well, well over $100 today in real money but you get to keep 40% of that. Um, that means, or I, I do, excuse me, I keep 40% when I've recruited you, but you can then go and recruit other people and re get 40%, and this goes on and on and on until 
you kind of reach a point where you really don't have very many other people that you can recruit. Uh, this both it helps explain the absolutely explosive growth of the Klan between about 1920 and 1923, but it also helps explain the equally rapid decline of the Klan because people began getting very pissed off that about all this money flowing into the uh, upwards to the center and ripping off people who were uh, who were recruited. They also had to pay weekly dues, and the Klan, like the Masons, had a ladder of stages that you could rise to become more and more uh, important, have a higher uh, title, but every time you rose a, a rung on the ladder, you had to pay more. Uh, furthermore, they manufactured this enormous number of trinkets. Uh, some of them were done by the Klan itself. Some of them were done by just enterprising people who knew they could make make uh, money on it. It started with the robes. The Klan uh, people were probably aware that a white robe like that could conceivably have been made by people's wives using sheets and stuff like that. And they insisted on a, a definition of the proper robe that required you to buy it. Uh, but there were also just this endless number of uh, advertisements all over for clan trinkets of every sort that you could possibly buy. Um, sorry that these got out of order, but this is one of the uh, vigilantism pictures. Um, and actually something I should mention because I think it will connect with some of you. Uh, some of the vigilantism was threatening rather than directly hostile. And those of you who have read uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X may remember that his family was driven out of Omaha, Nebraska by a group just like this, who circled the house, did not actually attack them, but let them know that they were going to be very vulnerable if they did not leave. Um, the uh, the, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to skip, skip uh, saying something about uh, the uh, women and feminism. I could talk about it in the questions because I just want to leave time for you to talk. Now, contemporary critics of the Klan often implicitly accepted its claim that it was working for the people. Uh, critics as I said at the beginning, commonly called the Klan's people backward, uneducated, white trash. Uh, and I think we see this trope today a lot in relation to Trump supporters. And I think it's both, as it was for the Klan, it's both not true and it's also counterproductive. Because it merely confirmed the Klan's hostility to the people they saw as these hyper-educated, urban, secular, uh, professionals. Um, in, in its claim to be representing the people, the Klan actually had a complex relationship to industrial workers and industrial unions. Uh, to some, it was implacably hostile and very effective at damaging them. Uh, in, in Maine, where there were a lot of wobblies, members of the IWW who were loggers and so on, they actually really drove the IWW out. They did that in many locations in the Northwest, in Washington State and parts of Oregon where the IWW was also strong. I mentioned before that in my, some mining towns and places like Carnegie, uh, they were not very popular, but on the other hand, uh, when uh, you had a labor force that was predominantly composed of white Protestants, and then uh, employers started to bring in immigrant workers, the clan, the, the, the union actually became clanized. This happened very particularly with the United Mine Workers because uh, uh, in southern Indiana where uh, the, the uh, employers tried to bring in con mainly Slavic uh, immigrants and uh, actually the clan, the union joined the clan in driving these people out. Um, now the clan did, let's see if I can get to my last image here. No, I guess not. 
The Klan did decline very rapidly. If it, if it had five million people at its peak, three years later, it seemed like it was in the hundreds of thousands. But you should not think that it was uh, devoid of victories or, uh, or um, influence. Um, you heard in the introduction uh, about the 1924 Democratic Convention where uh, the leading candidate for the presidential nomination was Al Smith, the governor of New York, who was a Catholic. This, uh, this convention uh, went down in history as the longest ever political convention in the history of America. It well, had 103 different ballots before the Klan and its supporters managed to defeat um, to defeat Al Smith. And they also did something that's very clever and really re uh, s uh, signals their kind of uh, PR work that was so great. Right across the river in New Jersey, the Klan erected a very, very tall burning cross, which was their symbol. Uh, they claimed that some of their crosses were 50 feet high. Again, I don't know if that's an exaggeration, but this cross, if you walked out of Madison Square Garden, anybody familiar with New York will understand what I'm talking about, and walk west to the banks of the Hudson River, you would see that huge cross in New Jersey. I think actually more, more important than that in terms of the Klan's achievement was the 1924 uh, federal immigration law. Uh, now, prior to 1924, there was no o overall restriction of immigrants. There were, there had been for a couple of decades, bans on Chinese immigrants, Japanese immigrants, other people coming into the West. But 1924 was the first time uh, that this happened. The, uh, the key uh, person who shepherded this, uh, Senator John Representative Johnson from the state of Washington, was openly a Klan member and he was the leader of the uh, bringing together the votes they needed to pass this. And the 1924 Immigration Act, some of you are familiar with it, it set quotas. Uh, and these quotas for different categories of people really essentially installed into law exactly the Klan's notion of the hierarchy of who are the superior and who are the inferior people. So the peoples that the Klan liked to call Nordic um, got very big quotas, uh, Italians, Jews, very, very small quotas. And I want to point out to you that this was the law of the land until 1965. This is a major chunk of U.S. history, and I'm not saying that the Klan was exclusively responsible for it, but clearly its influence uh, was, was felt there. Um, I'll just end by saying one more thing, and that is that um, even more than that, perhaps uh, the greatest, at least I hope short-term, influence the Klan was, you might say, making bigotry respectable so that it was no longer something that you whispered about. Um, it was something that you could publicly proclaim in many, many newspapers, speak about with pride. Um, and I think, uh, as we see today, that there is a difference between when people feel enough embarrassed about their bigotry that they only whisper it, and when they feel enough confidence that it's acceptable that they shout it. Anyway, thanks for listening. Um, thanks. thanks. And, you know, I'd love to hear any questions, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, here, please. To what extent did the plan get opposition from other Protestant ministers? Yeah. Uh, only, you know, the UCC would not have been very yes. for the Klan. Uh, very good question. Did you all hear his question about what? Yeah, the Klan had very little success with what were what you, we generally call the mainline Protestant groups, meaning Episcopalians, Presbyterians, etc. Um, but uh, you don't see a lot of religious figures taking the lead in condemning the Klan. What you see uh, in that uh, area are um, more secular journalists, 
uh, professionals, academics. But, you know, again, let me point out, this is the era in which people like Lothar Stoddard and uh, what's his name, blanking on the other guy's name, these were people who were teaching at elite universities in the United States, and they were great supporters of the Klan. I think you would. Uh, I was just wondering if um, the collapse of the Klan, if it was mainly due to internal forces, or if there are also outside forces at play that contributed to it. Yeah, I wish, I wish I could say that there had been a powerful grassroots movement against the Klan, but that was not the case. It was primarily um, uh, internal. Uh, it had to do with money. It had to do with the hypocrisy. But at the very end, there was a, a, a case um, so awful of a Klan leader that it got published throughout the United States. And this is where a guy called David Stevenson, who was the Grand Goblin of Indiana, was actually convicted of kidnapping, raping, torturing, and murdering his female assistant. Uh, I think that was too much for a lot of people, but um, you, you, ca you would have to look very hard and I have not found one yet, to find any clans person of a lower rank or at a lower level of atrocity convicted. It just wasn't happening. Yeah. yeah uh, well, I, 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 this is a fascinating book, and I really urge you to, to, to get it. And, and the, the, the movement, and I think it's fair to call it a movement, uh, has a lot of contradictions. Uh, and it, and one of them is this enormous popularity, uh, which is tied to its just deep anti-Semitism. Yet, <laughs> and, and, and I, I was just sort of struck by this incident you relate in the book of the Klan baseball team you mentioned. <laughs> playing, <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask. Yeah. Playing a Jewish baseball team. And I thought, in Southern California, what the hell was that about? <laughs> and who won? Because you didn't say anything. In the book. I, I didn't say it. I didn't know who won. And you probably remember that I, they also played a black team. The black yeah. team won. But yeah, this, and it's a really good question because it, it raises something that is a little bit more complex and nuanced. The Klan would claim that it didn't hate Jews. It didn't hate immigrants. It didn't hate Catholics. It just thought that they really should not be, should not have power in this country and in many ways wishes they would just leave the country. And you know, that is something that we hear, uh, if anybody's following this stuff today, going on today, and I'm not an expert, but there are a lot of the white nationalists who will say they don't hate black people. They just believe that God intended these different groups of people to be separate. Um, I don't actually think this claim that they didn't hate Jews is true. Yeah. Uh, the Klan, um, as well as its powerful electoral machine, and let me point out, because it just might be of interest, that at the back of the book is uh, one little appendix. It's a chart that is created by the Klan in which they list every senator, and by the name of the senator, they evaluate how friendly that senator is to the Klan. They were really very efficient here, but they also got involved in a lot of economic warfare. They tried to organize boycotts uh, of merchants who were not, um, as they called, right Americans. Um, these merchants were a lot of them Jews, but they were also Catholics, Greek Orthodox, and so on. Uh, they devised a, a wonderful system in which there was a kind of placard that said something like, we are 100% American, and if the business was a Klan-supporting business, you could display that in your window, and that was where you were supposed to shop. Um, apparently, there's not good evidence about this, but apparently there were some small uh, merchants who were actually driven out of business by the Klan. But when they tried to take on, well, they, when they tried to take on a really big thing, like for example, Meyer and Frank, the big department store uh, in Portland, which was at that time the largest 
chain, department store chain west of the Mississippi, they could not make a dent on Myron Frank. Women are too, too accustomed to shopping there. And also, if you read some of the few extant minutes of Claverns, you see that they're constantly uh, complaining that their members are violating the economic boycott by not boycotting. And I, I would assume that some of that is due to the fact that people, particularly women who do most of the shopping for a family, have a, a store that they're accustomed to going to. They like to go to that store. They like the people they're not about to, uh, to change. So actually, I would say the economic boycott was uh, much less successful uh, than uh, the political campaign. And you already heard figures about how many people they managed to elect. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you very much. This is great. Um, I, you didn't mention anything about international connections, and maybe that would be antithetical to what the Klan represented, but uh, particularly the notion that, uh, that, it's, that Jews are a race uh, and that they, which is different from the previous, you could convert and, uh, and that's so much like Nazi ideology. I'm wondering if there were any connections with, uh, with the Nazis and also uh, if they had some anti-Bolshevik, uh, if they in any way uh, had anti-Bolshevik uh, Really, uh, really ideology. good questions. Uh, to start with the last one, one of the big surprises to me was how little anti-communism I saw in this literature of the Klan, and I can't quite explain it, uh, especially because uh, those of you historians remember that after World War I, there was a tremendous repression of any dissenting, people dissenting from the left uh, and raising the specter of communism, and furthermore, maybe not then, but soon, the southern white supremacists would, uh, any time there was any African-American civil rights movement, they claimed, they targeted it, with, called it communist, and they claimed that, oh, you know, the, these black people were perfectly happy until these communists came and stirred them up. But um, about Nazism, I have some information about what happened in the 30s, and what's interesting is that many, or at least some that we can identify, some Klan leaders joined uh, the, not, the American Nazi groups that were around in the 1930s. We don't hear a lot about them. They weren't huge, but we do have the silver shirts, the brown shirts, the German-American bun. They were holding huge rallies in Madison Square Garden and so on. Um, the, uh, oh, and one other, you know, kind of hypocritical thing about it. The, the clan, a lot of clans people became ardent fans of this radio personality called Father Charles Coughlin, who was kind of like this first shock jock. But Charles Coughlin is a Catholic. Yeah. So again, uh, you know, there are things that can trump that. I don't see any direct uh, international connections to Europe. But what we do know, and actually I only learned this after finishing the book, is that when the Nazis were building or were creating their eugenics laws, they were actually taking a, a lead from what the Americans had already done. Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, um, so on the theme of Jesus would have been a Klansman, the theme of Jesus would have been a Klansman, yeah. was that did they use scripture to justify that, like we saw other groups doing, or was that just kind of an understood hypocrisy of the time? Too? That's a very good point. Uh, because in their uh, theology, the Jews were Christ killers, of course. And you, I don't know, a while back, maybe I can get it back, there was this uh, slide that I, I didn't um, have time to, to comment on. Uh, that, w that shows Uncle Sam on the cross, and he is in, I don't know if I can get this up, he has been put on the cross by the Jews in, in this, um, well, it just isn't working now, so. Um, but, again, uh, I was actually surprised, despite all this 
stuff about the cross and their, how many ministers they had who were not only openly praising the Klan in their sermons, but actually encouraged people to join the Klan. I was surprised how little they actually quoted scripture. Um, I don't n know quite why that is, and I don't know enough about evangelical religion to know if it was characteristic. Uh, and you, you understand when I'm talking, you saying evangelicals, I'm talking about white evangelicals. The country had tons of black evangelicals who were absolutely on the, the other side here. But in a way, the absence of that quoting of scripture struck me in the same way that the absence of anti-communism struck me. Uh, it was a surprise. And uh, I can't, I can't completely explain it, or can't explain it at all. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, He's bringing you a mic. Uh, what, if any, uh, relationship did, uh, what? what, if any, relationship did the uh, Klan have to the uh, Masons? Klan The Masons, the Freemasons. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the... Whenever a Klan organizer, a Klegel as they call it, came to town, the first place he went was to the Masons. Uh, and those of you who know about the Masons can understand why, because they're traditionally very, very anti-Catholic. Um, the, uh, the membership of the Klan who were Masons war, was very high. Um, they um, emulated the Masonic ritual to some extent, especially these ladders, which are called degrees that you can move up. But there's something else that was happening that I didn't mention at all that makes this a little different from the Masons, which is I see the Klan at this moment as kind of a transitional organization between the fraternals of the 19th century and the modern groups like the Rotary Club, which are essentially networking groups for business people. The Klan had a lot of well-to-do people. Now, it did not seem to be able to recruit the very kind of ruling class, Wall Street, uh, uh, big corporate owners. But they did have uh, a lot of people who were high managers, who were owners of significant businesses, and um, what I do argue in the book, and this is, di again, different from the Masons, is that in many locations, joining the Klan was a way of becoming middle class, of, bec of raising your status, because it allowed you to hobnob with uh, these important people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought us back to that point because you also, in the course of your talk, let us know that there was a decline of the Klan. And if one of, its, one of the main reasons people got involved was that it was an on-ramp into the middle class, uh, and they didn't, you said something about earlier, they didn't get some of their goals and ambitions fulfilled, um, they left. What is interesting to me about what you're describing is that there was, um, and I need to do more thinking about it, but from the first clan to the second coming, there's this, there's some kind of continuity of ideology that's both a combination of white supremacy and something else. And if as an organization the clan declined, the people who were uh, had a propensity to embrace that ideology, it seems to me that they found other means to support what they care about because they're not gone. Here it is, we're in 2018, and, and I don't know how much they really represent the population, but they're using whatever tools are available to them today, including internationally, to sort of amplify and bolster what they do. And I'm just curious about your thoughts about the ideology itself. You know, so that if the Klan as an organization decline, sort of what insights you have about the legacy of the Klan, how it has survived from 
whether it's the 40s or the even the 60s until now, something about your insights about, because what's push, for me, what's pushing up against it is where our founding ideals as a democratic republic, where those ideals fit with them, sit with them, what relationship they have to them or not, because clearly all kinds of people around them are believing in them, embracing them, pushing back against things like the Klan. I just am curious about your thoughts about that. This, if you want, one way to think of it is this, so just to simplify it, if white supremacy is a major threat all along, what you have all around it is these impulses from all kinds of groups who are really trying to get the country to live up to its ideals. And here it is, the, declan the Klan declined, but the ideals around white supremacy lived on some kind of way among some kinds of people. And I'm just curious about what insights you have about what relationship those that ideology had to the core ideals of this country. Uh, that part is a mystery to me, just how people put all that together. Okay, um, uh, it's a big question. I'll try to answer it, although when I get close to the present, my, my knowledge is fairly limited. One of the interesting things about the Klan is that they claim to be great supporters of democracy. And um, if you understood, uh, you know, I, I, in the book I call this Herdfolk democracy, which is a German term that was used in South Africa, you know, democracy among the white people, or the Klan would say, the true Americans. Um, but um, so they did not see themselves as in any way breaking with the kind of American traditions you're talking about. They claimed frequently that the founding fathers shared their views. Uh, they uh, frequently said that not only that the US had always been a white Protestant country, which is not correct, but also that it was destined by God to be a white Protestant country. So they did not in any way see themselves as, in fact, they saw the influx of the immigrants as undermining American values. Now, afterwards, you know, it's true that those uh, bigoted, I call it bigotry because I need to include religion as well as race. Those ideas live on, but there's a, there's a, a trajectory here in which sometimes they become somewhat more stigmatized and somewhat quieter and then at other times louder. Uh, the uh, World War II did a lot to stigmatize eugenics and others of this racist stuff. But what is totally different today, I believe, from what I understand. The Klan itself is very small. The Klan is only one among many white nationalist groups. And it, it is not even the leading edge or the most prestigious to those people. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. I think it may be uh, that people associate the Klan with lynching and that's going a little bit far even for uh, some of the very f far right people. So what what I would want to say is that these ideas are there, and they are re re coming up to the surface again. Uh, but I don't think we should think about it organizationally in terms of the Ku Klux Klan itself. Um, and the other thing that's different is the Ku Klux, the, both the first and the second Klan. These were uh, centralized organizations. Uh, what's going on today is not to the best of my knowledge, centralized at all. And I think that's in some ways good news, uh, but in some ways bad news because the lack of centralization also means the lack of any kind of control over uh, what kind of crazy violence we're going to see. So if there are no more questions, I, I'd really like to thank Professor Gordon for joining us. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.